<laughs> well, thank you for coming, and I pray that God will bless you and give you some nuggets tonight. Uh, the lesson that we're going to have tonight on uh, Romans the 14th chapter is really uh, the Christ talking about a Christian and doubtful things. I put doubtful things because we're going to talk about some doubtful things tonight. Uh, if Christians should or shouldn't do. And so Paul is going to clear it up for us tonight. And so uh, I, I think it's going to be a real good lesson. You've got two pages to your notes. Don't be afraid because only half of the first page, or not even half of it, is our teaching tonight. The rest of it is a teaching that uh, I feel like the... Uh, well, I got this teaching on a guide to uh, righting wrongs years and years ago when I joined this prayer uh, group, and they gave us these notes, so I just wrote them out. I thought, well, that'd be good to fill on our page, because then I had been thinking about uh, when we want to ask people's forgiveness, and then when we offend people, and when people offend us, and so these are some uh, guidelines that you can go by. We might go over them a little bit, but... Not that much, it's for, mainly for you to take them home and read them. And um, they work for me, and I, I know they work for you. <laughs> but anyway, tonight in the 14th chapter of Romans, um, well, I'm going to shock some of you a little bit tonight. Uh, I was going to get a tattoo today, but I couldn't find zebra gun. <laughs> I don't sell zebra gum anymore. <laughs> Did you really uh, think I was going to get a tattoo today? Pardon? Get them out of those little quarter machines. Oh, can you? Oh, well, my kids and my grandkids, I bought zebra gum all along. And today I thought, oh, Lord, you know what? I need to buy a pack of zebra gum and put it. A tattoo on my arm, and it so it goes along with what our lesson is about uh, doubtful things. <laughs> uh, matter of fact, I'll tell you the story of what got me into thinking about this tattoo. When we read this here, it's going to remind it'll remind you of what Paul was talking about. Oh, some years ago, three or four years ago, I was headed into uh, Kmart and. A lady that I know that's a very dear friend of mine, and I've known her for years. I mean, her kids and my kids grew up together, and we taught kids together, and we took them on camping trips, and we did all these things, and she was a very, but I hadn't seen her for a long time, and I was going into Kmart. I got out of my car, and she was coming out of Kmart, and she saw me. Oh, Barbara, come here. I've got something wonderful I've got to tell you. And I thought, praise the Lord. So I... Ran, uh, uh, trotted a little bit over where she was, and she hugged me, and she said, I've got to show you my new tattoo. I went, I mean, it was like throwing water in my face. I thought, tattoo? And she opened her blouse and showed me. It was right there, and it was all red. I just got my tattoo today. Now, she's about the same age as I am, and so I could have, you could have knocked me off with, over with a um, Mr. Breath or whatever. And I, and I thought, oh, what do I say? Because oh, all of a sudden, she was showing me the tattoo. And I'm thinking, you're a Christian. <laughs> you know, all these things were going over in my mind. I was thinking, oh, what do I say? And she said, oh, does it look nice? And I said, well, sure, looks like bread. Because <laughs> she had just got it and it was all, oh, me and my husband, we decided that I should get a tattoo. And I wanted it right over my heart. And so now I've got this tattoo. And of all the people in the world, she would probably have been the last one I've ever thought that would get a tattoo in her 60s. <laughs> At that time, she was probably around 69 or something. And, and so really, I went home to my husband and I said, you'll not believe who I met today and what they showed me. And he said, probably I won't. <laughs> and anyway, I told him about this friend of ours. And she had it too. He said, you've got to be kidding. <laughs> and so him and I felt the very same way. Well, anyway, over this time, period of time, you know, sometimes we think Christians, we uh, put them in a little box and we think that, 
you know, and I know she loves the Lord. Well, she was excited about her tattoo. Well, I got pierced ears, so I thought, okay, Lord. <laughs> but who would be the weaker Christian? Me or her? Me. Because I did not want to accept anyone getting a tattoo. I'm not even for tattoos. But I don't mind if people get a tattoo. It doesn't bother me anymore. <laughs> so I think she shocked it, it shocked it out at me. So if people get a tattoo, that's between them and God. It's not between you and me. It's not between each other. So this is the reason I have named this the Christian and the doubtful things that sometimes we, we have a tendency to uh, put a Christian in a little box and this is what they all should look like and this is what they all should do and do as I, you know. But we'll find out tonight that Paul isn't going to be saying that. In uh, Romans 14 chapter, Paul started out and he said, Him that is weak in the faith receive you, but not to doubtful disputations. In other words, not to questionable opinions. You know what opinions are? They come from me. But convictions come from the Holy Spirit. I can have different opinions, and that doesn't matter. I think the pastor said this the other day. Opinions, they are just like your nose. They smell. So <laughs> we should not put our opinions upon someone else. Now, if it's out and out sin, yes, what the Bible completely comes and tells us is a sin. So, Paul said here in 14, we're going to read 14 uh, verses 1 through 9, and then we're going to come back over and talk about this. Paul says, For one believes that he may eat all things, another who is weak eats herbs. I thought about the vegetarians. <laughs> Let not him that eat despise him that eat not. And not, let not him which eats not judge him that eats. <laughs> For God has received him. Yes, amen. So in other words, God, if God receives us, and it's from our hearts that we sin, it's from our hearts that we do things that are displeasing to God, not the outward appearance. Uh, used to be, if anyone wore makeup, it was a sin. <laughs> if anyone wore slacks, it was a sin. And we were under people's opinions. Our teachers, there's the phone. It must be the Lord calling. <laughs> <laughs> so he says, Let not him that eat despise him that eat not. And let not him which eats not, uh, not judge him that eats. For God has received him. Who are you that judge another man's servant? To his own master he stands or falls. Yes, he shall be held up, for God is able to make him stand. One man esteems one day above another. Another esteems every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. He that regardeth the day regardeth it to the Lord. And he that regardeth not the day to the Lord, he does not regard it. He that eats, eats to the Lord, for he gives God things. And he that eats not to the Lord, he eats not, and gives God things. For none of us live, listen to this, mark this in your Bible, for none of us live to himself. And no man dies to himself. For whether we live, we live to the Lord. Or whether we die, we die to the Lord. Whether we live, therefore, or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ both died and rose and revived, in other words, rose again, uh, lives, lives, that he might be both Lord of the dead and of the living. Who are the weak faith here? Who's the weak one? The weak one is the one that's the vegetarian. I call him a vegetarian. I mean, don't be offended if you're a vegetarian because I wish I, I love, I mean, most, I don't like meat that much, but vegetables I love. So, but have you ever noticed that a vegetarian, we, where I work, we used to have some vegetarians. And boy, they looked down on those that were to eat meat. And they were always telling me why I shouldn't be cooking meat and why I shouldn't be serving meat. 
But you know what? I didn't feel that way. I feel like God had given all the food to eat. So, and if I'm praying over to being thankful for that meat, then God blesses it. So Paul's saying, those that don't eat meat, and we're going to find out who those people really were, and, well, I call them vegetarians, but also we're going to find out that it was under the law also. So you'll find that vegetarians, how many is a vegetarian here? Don't take it personally, please. <laughs> so you'll find that the vegetarians are always telling you what's wrong with eating something else. And, and I used to watch this cooking program on TV. I can't think what her name is, but she's a vegetarian. And she would make all these dishes, and then she'd give this speech of why people are sick and why all these things is happening. And you'd think, oh, Lord. You felt just sort of maybe guilty from eating whatever, you know, meat. But Paul is talking here, and he's saying the weak brother is the one that puts stipulation on other people. <laughs> They're offended because you can be who you want to be. God wants you to be. But if you've got to be like me, then I have put judgment upon you, and I put you under condemnation, and you know, the person that is weak in that area, that's always putting their uh, expectations on you, they're the ones, their conscience, they have it, they really don't know that they're free and let other people be free. If that's what they want to eat, then eat it and keep your mouth shut. Just be thankful that's where that's what you want to do but we don't have to make everyone else that way those who have a lack of knowledge of their liberty in christ jesus they will hang on to a teaching in the past traditions religious or their way of thinking about things and they'll always tell you about it what we should eat or observe certain days now, I know a denomination, and there's probably more, but I know a denomination that always, uh, and they're vegetarian, they try to be vegetarians, a lot of them, and Viga, uh, Viga, I think it's a Viga Vegetarians, is where they eat absolutely no eggs, no butter, no nothing like that. So, these people, they observe, they go into the Old Testament, and they begin to observe the Old Testament, and they think that because they're living the diet and the days of the Old Testament, that they are right. Well, what happened was, Paul is writing this letter to the Romans, and in Rome, there is the Christian Gentiles, which they were free. They found out that they could, I mean, you know, Christ had set them free. And then we find out the Christian Jews didn't like it because the Gentile Christians were having a joyful time. And one thing we're going to go into, so doubtful practices are not to be judged. Let's look at, for, uh, well, 10 and 13, Romans 14, 10 and 13, then we're going to go to the other scriptures. It says, but why do you judge your brother? Or why do you get said at nothing your brother? For why do you say at not nothing your brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And for it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us will give an account of himself to the Lord. Every one of us. So why do we judge one another? Because you know what? We think we don't want them to miss heaven. But we can tell if they've got love for each other, if they've got joy in their life, they've got peace in their life, they've got long suffering, and they're always about the Lord's work and they're doing things, but yet they just don't believe in doing this or that. Well, that's good for them, but what's good for them should be good for us too. So we should leave each other alone and not be judging each other how each other should live. We should pray for our brothers, and we'll find out about that. Let's go to 1 Corinthians, and this explains what Paul was really talking about in 1 Corinthians, the 8th chapter. Verses 1 through 13. I know it sounds like a lot, but don't, it's interesting. <laughs> 1 Corinthians, 8th chapter. Paul says, Now is concerning things offered to idols. We know that all 
that we all have knowledge, but knowledge puffs up, but charity edifies. You know, the more knowledge we think we have, you know what? The more we think we're better than someone else. I was, I, and I may have told this little joke before, but there was uh, some ducks in this pond, and they were having a good time, and there was frogs there. And the frogs said to the ducks, you know, I really envy you guys, because whenever it starts turning winter, you just fly right off and you go to where it's warm. And I have to stay in this pond and die. And so the, they were all talking about this, and finally the uh, frog said, I have a good idea. And the duck said, well, bring it on. Why don't you two ducks go get a stick and bring it to the pond, and I'll hang on to it with my mouth in the middle of the stick, and as you both fly off, I can go with you. Oh, that sounds like a good idea, said the ducks. Or the geese, it was geese, really. So they went and they got the stick, and the frog hung on to the middle of the stick. You probably heard this joke. And as they're flying through the sky, there's a farmer out in the field, and he looked and he said, what a genius idea. Who came up with that? And the frog goes, I <laughs> did. <laughs> So what is knowledge does it get you into trouble? And not that if you get knowledge and you use it, but when we get puffed up so many times, that's what Paul says. Knowledge puffs up, but love covers a multitude of sins. And then in the second verse it says, and we're all baptized to Moses in the, oh, I skipped over, I'm not even in the eighth chapter. And if he doesn't think that he knows anything, he knows nothing yet as he ought to know. But if any man love God, the same is known of him. Isn't that true? As concerning, therefore, the eating of those things which are offered in sacrifice to idols, this is what he's talking about even when he in Romans, those things, the, uh, the meat that the Gentiles, and the, they would go out the heathen and they would offer this meat to idols. And then they would take that meat and go into the uh, marketplace and they would sell it cheap. So the Jews would not eat meat because that was offered to idols and that was a sin to them. That's okay. But they brought that on everyone else. And they were weak because they couldn't accept people that went and bought the meat in the marketplace that was offered to idols. And Paul says in verse 4, As concerning therefore the eating of those things that are offered and sacrificed to idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world. Did you know that an idol is nothing? Only to those that think it's something. You know that when we're afraid of the devil, he knows it. And when we know who we are in Christ, he knows it. Remember when Paul, whenever the seven sons of Sceva went and they tried to cast the devil out, and they said, the devil, the demon said, we know Paul and we know Jesus, but who are you? They know who we are. Do you know why? Because we should know who we are in Christ Jesus. We should know what Christ has done for us and where we stand before God. And when we do that, then we can uh, operate according to the way God is uh, We can. Eat them. Paul says, I eat that meat, it doesn't even bother me. Because what is an idol? It's nothing. Verse 5, for though, there, uh, for though there be that are called gods, whether in heaven or in earth, as there be gods many and lords many, but he says, but to us there is but one God. To, to Paul, there was only one God. These other ones weren't gods. They were just images that people worship, things they did. The, there's many gods in this world, he said, but to him, there was only one God, and it was the Lord Jesus Christ. The Father of whom are all things, and we in him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him. Uh, uh, however, there is not, that is not in every man that thinks not that, <coughs> however, there is not in every man that knowledge. For some with conscience of the idol. To this very hour, eat it as a thing offered unto an idol. And their conscience, being weak, is defiled. So they, these, the person that thinks that they can't eat that meat offered to idols, maybe their conscience, is, it, it, it makes them 
feel like they're sinning if they're doing. And if that's the case, they should not be eating the meat. But us that can eat the meat that's offered idol shouldn't look down on the one that doesn't feel like it's right to eat the meat. Or the one that doesn't feel like it's right to eat the meat shouldn't complain about the one that is free to eat the meat. You see what I mean? We, we, we're, if we don't watch in Christians and, and, and really in uh, uh, different churches, we're always picking on each other. Well, they're not like us. We, we do this and they do that. You know what? Unless it's committing adultery, stealing, killing, doing those things, we should just be quiet. Just like the lady that had the tattoo <coughs> that I thought, oh my goodness, I mean, you know, who was offended? Me, not her. But you know what? I found out that it didn't matter because it was between her and God and not me and her. <laughs> And so that's what Paul is trying to get oh, in here. And then, but me, in the eighth verse, but he says, but me commendeth us not to God. Isn't that true? Me doesn't make you any more spiritual. Vegetarians, that don't make you any more spiritual. But many times we think we are spiritual. If we do things that um, we think is wrong for us. And if someone else says, oh, you should be spiritual like me. And you wouldn't be doing those things. But me commendeth us not to God, for if neither if we eat are we the better, neither if we eat not are we the worse. <laughs> but take heed, lest by any means this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to them that are we. This is where we have to watch that we don't become a stumbling block. That we don't become a stumbling block to someone that is we. You know, some people, uh, and my daughter and her husband are pastors of a church. And so when we went to visit them one time, she said, oh, mom, we're going to go to the movies Saturday night. You want to go with us? And I said, you know I don't like movies. I don't even believe in movies. She said, well, what's wrong with it? It's a, it's a, uh, I forget what kind of movie it was. Um, old cartoon ones and things like that. And I said, I don't care. I don't even want to go into the place. <laughs> But you see, I had a conviction over movies. You know why? Because I had a hang up with movies when I was young. And I would put them before God. And they didn't. And so they don't watch horrible movies. But even going to a movie, I didn't, I don't, to me, you know, I don't agree with that. I don't even want anyone to know if I did go in, I would sneak in. Even <laughs> went to a Billy Graham movie one time and I told my husband, I am so miserable, I'm going to get out of this place. <laughs> and so, anyway, that's just where me. But you know what? I don't pass my judgment on someone else that it's not wrong for them. Because it's not from, God is not convicting them. Maybe he convicted me because it was wrong for me because I put them before the Lord. So, Paul says in 10, For if any man see you which hath knowledge sitting at me in the idol's temple, shall not the conscience of him which is weak be emboldened to eat those things which are offered to idols? Sometimes we might make people uh, feel like, oh, well, they're doing it. I can do it. And that's not right. You know, just because you can wear makeup, maybe I can't wear makeup. Maybe it becomes a stumbling block in my life. So many times, I'm, I'm just using that for a little petty example, but we have to watch that we don't put a stumbling block in the path of someone that's really sincere and judge them and uh, make them feel like, oh, you don't even know your liberty in Christ. So we need to be very careful is what Paul's saying here. And though your knowledge shall the weak pro uh, brother perish for whom Christ died, but when you sin so against the brother and wound his weak conscience, you sin against Christ. In other words, the person that is a vegetarian and believes that and they believe that it's a sin to eat meat, I shouldn't be eating meat in front of them. If I invite a dinner, it's a vegetarian dinner, <laughs> you know. But be friends with them and because that may be a sin to them to eat meat because it was offered in the idol, to the idols. So there, he's, Paul says, therefore, if me take my brother to offend, I shall eat no flesh while the world stands, lest I make my brother to offend. 
So we have to be conscious of one another, loving each other. Because by this shall all men know that you're my disciples if you're a vegetarian or if you're a meat eater. No. By this shall all men know that you're my disciples. If you have love and accept one another for who they are and just love them in Christ, love them in Christ. Turn over to Colossians, uh, the second chapter, verses 16 and 17. Colossians 2, verses 16 and 17. Paul says this. Let no man therefore judge you in meat, or in drink, or in respect of a holy, holy day, or of a new moon, or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow. They are only a shadow of things to come. But the body is of Christ. In other words, uh, I've met people that said, if you don't keep Saturday, the Saturday is the Sabbath. If you don't keep that day holy, you're going to hell. They really say that. And you know, our tendency is to come back and try to correct them. But you know, if that's the way they feel, well, like I told you once before, I knew a couple, uh, a family that went to church on Saturday and Sunday because they wanted to make sure they were keeping the, the law and they were make sure they weren't, they weren't sinning against God. Well, you know, to me that was weird. Because I know what Christ did for me. He set us free. The Sabbath was made for me, not me for the Sabbath. Not you for the Sabbath. And so Jesus rose the first day of the week. And on the first day of the week, matter of fact, every day is the first day of the week for me. Every day. We should worship God every day. And we should put him there. Okay. Christian's responsibility uh, Romans 14, 14 to 21. He says, Paul says, I know and am persuaded by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself. But to him that esteems anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. But if your brother be grieved <coughs> with your need, now walk you how walk you not circumspectly, or no, what's that word? Charitably. Charitably. <laughs> Destroy not him with your meat for whom Christ died. Let not your good be evil spoken of. Um, for the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. How many, we used to, the church I went to, we used to just sing scripture. We'd sing scripture most of the time. Uh, and I always loved it because that helps you to memorize scripture. How many know the song this year? The kingdom of God is not meat or drink. The kingdom of God is not meat or drink, but righteousness, peace, and joy. The kingdom of God is not meat or drink, but righteousness, peace, and joy. The kingdom of God is not meat or drink, but righteousness, peace, and joy. To peace, joy, and peace, and righteousness in the Holy Ghost. Joy and peace and righteousness in the Holy Ghost. Romans 14, 17. <laughs> so we used to sing the courses out of the Bible, the verses, and then we would quote the scripture of where it was at. Paul says, For he that for he that in these things serve Christ is acceptable to God. And approved of man. Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace and things wherewith one may edify another. What do we do? Edify another. For meat destroys not the work of God, for all things indeed are pure, but it is evil for that man who eats with offense. It is good neither to eat flesh nor to drink wine nor anything whereby your brother stumbles, or is offended, or is made weak. So I wrote the last thing. Doubtful practices are to be tolerated. Romans 14, 22, and we're going to go into 7, 1, uh, to 15, 7. Have you faith? He asked the question. Have it to yourself before God. Happy is he that condemneth not himself in that thing which he allows. And he that doubt, doubts is uh, damned if he eats, because he eats not of faith. For whatever 
Whatsoever is not of faith is sin. What is it? Whatsoever is not of faith is sin. What does Hebrews 11, 6 tell us? Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. For he that comes to God must believe that he exists, and that he rewards those who diligently seek him. So faith is what pleases God. So Paul says, for whatsoever is not of faith is sin. When then are strong, when then that are, oh, I can't even read tonight, I don't know why. We then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities or the weakness of the wind. We. Oh, really? Yeah, that's what Paul says. And not to please ourselves. Let every one of us please his neighbor for his good to edification. For even Christ pleased not himself. Oh, here we go back. Lord, make my life to be like Christ. That's what he, we, we are to pray. For even Christ pleased not himself, as it's written. The reproaches of them that reproached you fall upon me. For whatsoever things are written before time are written for our learning, that we, through patience and comfort of the scriptures, might have hope. Now the God of peace, consolation, grant you to be like-minded, one towards another, according to Christ Jesus, that you may, with one mind and one mouth, glorify God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, Wherefore, receive you one another, as Christ also received us to the glory of God. So to sum it all up, Paul is telling us, the weak brother is the one that everything maybe might be a sin to them. But you know what? The, strong, the weak, the stronger one that has their liberty. And that was what was happening in Rome. The Jews were saying, you're not supposed to do, eat these things, you're not supposed to do these things. They were still carrying on the teachings of the law. And the Gentiles were just living it up. So, like I said, we are to consider each other with love and not condemn each other and not judge each other. And so what I did is, like I said, years ago, I got this thing in the mail, about, I mean, not in the mail, but when I took this course, about uh, forgiveness, and I thought, well, that would be a good thing to give to you, and we don't have time to go over the whole thing, but I want to see, I put down, I just quickly, over. I want you to take it home and study it. It says, a guide to righting wrongs. Within the family of God, this is within the family of God. When you are the offender, when you are the, the offender, the one who has done wrong, first it must be set right with God, and I give you scriptures. Accept God's forgiveness and forgive yourself by receiving the gift of forgiveness that God has given you by his work on the cross. I'm going to give you some more scriptures. Next, it must be set right with those offended. And remember, the guy goes to, to offer his gift, and he can't offer his gift until he goes and makes things right. And then he comes back and offers his gift. A confession uh, a confession to the offender. Important. The confession should be only as public as was the offense. Just name the basic offense. The devil would want you to confess every thought to everyone. Don't do it. Ask for forgiveness. Remember, forgiveness is not a feeling. This is what I want you to remember. Forgiveness is not a feeling as it is an act of obedience. You may not feel like that anything happened. But it did, because wrong approach, these are wrong approaches that this teaching said. Sharing the blame. I'm sorry, but if only you had not. <laughs> Being vague. I'm sorry, forgive me. Placing a doubt. If I have been wrong, I'm sorry. If I have been wrong, I'm sorry. Right approach. Name basic offense. I see I have been wrong, and blah, blah, blah. Will you forgive me? Sometimes restitution must be made, and I'm not going to go ahead and down around the whole thing. But as I was writing this down, I felt like the Lord wants us to have a little guideline to go by, and it's helped me through these many years. And so when I offend someone, I want to go to them, and sometimes I don't even know I've offended someone, and so you can't help that if you have. 
And then, then I go down and give you, when you are offended, the one who has been wrong, then I give some, the, the little teaching on what you do on that. So when you are the Christian who sees a brother sinning, and I give you some scriptures, pause to pray for guidance. Just don't go and blurt out the sin. I have done that. Oh my. What I received back myself was terrible. I don't want to go through that anymore. I learned my lesson. Pray and ask God to lead you if you are to go and to correct a brother or sister in the Lord that you may have uh, you see someone sinning. Pray, number one. First John 5, 16 says, if we see our brother sin a sin which is not unto death, we should pray and ask for forgiveness for them. We should pray for them. And then God will work in their life. Well, that's all the teaching. And next week I will be uh, summing up Romans. We're finishing uh, chapter 15 and going to uh, chapter 16. So we will be summing up Romans. Now, if you've lost, I'm, I'm not lost, but uh, didn't get some of the lessons, write your name and the ones that you want, give them to me, and I will take and bring them to you. And get them ran off and bring them to you. If you want all the lessons to Romans. Uh, and next week will be the last lesson. Father, thank you so much for your word. You are so good to us. Lord, you give us time to grow. And sometimes, Lord, we don't give people time to grow. We think that they should be adults right when they're born. But we don't expect that of little kids and little children. And so, Lord, I pray that we will have passion and patience and, and just wait until people grow in the Lord and see that growth. But, Lord, sometimes we have people that have been Christian for years still sucking on a bottle. Then, Lord, your Holy Spirit will deal with them and give us the right thing to, to build them up and to encourage them to keep walking with you, Father, and to put down those, that bottle and to begin to take the word and begin to grow by it. In Jesus' name, Father, I thank you for these people, Lord, for this church and for this pastor and sis and for each one of my brothers and sisters. Lord, you know my heart. You know I love them with all my heart. And I, went, and I see them, they make my heart glad, Lord. And I enjoy coming and fellowshipping with each other. And I know they do too. So, Lord, I thank you for your word tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Lord bless you.